In the winter of 2014, the southeastern United States was blasted by two powerful winter storms within two weeks. Occurring during an abnormally cold winter due to the emergence of the polar vortex, the bitter cold temperatures, enhanced snowfall, and thick ice accumulations had severe consequences for southern major cities like Birmingham and Atlanta. While the winter weather was accurately forecasted, local and state officials failed to gather and mobilize the necessary equipment to clear the roads, resulting in thousands of car accidents on major highways across the southeast. Today, we'll look at how the deviation of the polar vortex can cause major winter storms in more southerly latitudes, analyze the forecasts that were dispatched days before the first event, and come to understand how just a few inches of snow shut down the entire city of Atlanta in what is colloquially remembered as Snowmageddon 2014. The logistical nightmare starts now. The winter of 2014 was blisteringly cold and unusually wet in the Midwestern United States and remembered by many kids as the winter with the extended Christmas break. Starting in December of 2013, meteorologists noticed that weather models were picking up on the possibility of a swath of Arctic air invading the Midwest the first week of January. This spinning column of air, normally located north of 60 degrees latitude and extending over the North Pole, is called the polar vortex. And while not many people realize this, there are actually two of them in the Northern Hemisphere. The tropospheric polar vortex is located in the troposphere, closer to the ground. The stratospheric polar vortex is located in the stratosphere, obviously, directly above the tropospheric polar vortex. At certain times in the winter, the stratosphere can warm by tens of degrees Fahrenheit above the tropospheric polar vortex, causing the winds at 60 degrees north to slow down, stop, and even reverse direction. This event is called a sudden stratospheric warming, and it can cause the polar vortex to spill outward towards the equator, bringing the Arctic air into the mid-latitudes of the United States. Now, typically these breakdowns or spillages of the polar vortex happen when the northern annular mode is in its negative phase. The northern annular mode, or the NAM, refers to the pattern of winds circulating around the Arctic at about 55 degrees north latitude. The NAM oscillates between two different phases and is large scale consequences on surface temperature and precipitation in the mid-latitudes. During the positive phase of the NAM, strong winds in the polar jet stream blow from west to east around lower pressure over the North Pole. Higher pressure to the south helps to reinforce this pattern, keeping the mid-latitudes drier and warmer, while keeping the Arctic much colder. However, during the negative phase, the winds surrounding the Arctic become weaker and the air pressure rises, causing large-scale distortions in the jet stream pattern, allowing for the cold air to spill further southward. What complicates this incident in January of 2014 was that there wasn't a large-scale disruption in the NAM phase before the Arctic blast in January. Typically, when you have these intense sudden stratospheric warmings over the polar vortex, the greatest area of warming happens directly over the pole itself. Meteorologists use the measurement of geopotential height because the height of a column of air is proportional to its temperature. So the higher the geopotential height, the warmer the temperature of air in the column beneath. In January of 2014, the anomalous geopotential height rises weren't observed over the North Pole, but rather over Alaska in Siberia. Because of this lopsided warming, the polar vortex distorted in rather unusual ways. Instead of splitting and a piece swinging down over the Midwest as it often does, it became elliptical in nature, stretching horizontally along an east-west axis. Stick with me here. The shape and composition of a stretched polar vortex can completely change how energy is reflected in the stratosphere. You see, large-scale disruptions in the atmosphere called planetary waves move and form constantly around the Earth. This energy produced by these waves propagates upward and northward from Eurasia, reflects off the polar vortex, and is amplified as it races back down into the troposphere in North America, which is the lowest level of our atmosphere where all the weather occurs. So in January of 2014, these reflected planetary waves manifested as amplified troughs of cold Arctic air that stretched down over the Great Plains in the Midwest, just grazing the Southeast. Where scientists take issue with the term polar vortex is that the media came out with headlines like central US to get hit with polar vortex or the polar vortex is back, implying the mere existence of the polar vortex is why our winter weather happens or that the entire polar vortex was moving over the United States, which is simply not the case. 
Take a look at this image here. The black outline represents the extent of the tropospheric polar vortex, while the white outline represents the stratospheric polar vortex. Between January 3rd and 8th, a sharp amplified ridge and subsequent trough moved across the United States from west to east, pulling the boundary of the tropospheric polar vortex southward into the United States. But looking at these maps, it's pretty clear that the polar vortex itself didn't really go anywhere. It's still centered over the North Pole. We just got a taste of that cold Arctic air. I don't think meteorologists would care as much about the misuse of the term polar vortex if it wasn't for the existence of Twitter. It seemed like January of 2014 was the first time anyone not in the weather community heard that term and the internet just ran with it. Media companies were even compiling lists of best soup places to eat during the polar vortex winter. Kids who were on Christmas break were supposed to return to school on Monday, January 6th, and now this giant mass of Arctic air called the polar vortex was swooping in, causing the entire state of Minnesota to cancel school for the first time in 17 years, giving every kid in the Midwest at least two extra days of holiday break. But despite the cold, fans gathered at Lambeau Field in Green Bay on that Sunday night to watch the Packers lose on a last second field goal in zero degree weather during the NFL wildcard round. If you didn't drink your beer quick enough, it would surely freeze. As the trough of Arctic air dove down through the Midwest, several lows rode northeast along the temperature boundary, injecting moisture into the atmosphere, creating widespread snowfall from OKC to Milwaukee. On January 7th, 140 million people in the country experienced sub-zero temperatures. Thousands of flights were canceled, and one plane dangerously skid across runway ice and crashed into a snowbank at JFK Airport. Snow now blanketed the majority of the Midwest and the Northeast, with lake effect snow continuing near the Great Lakes. But by Thursday, the bitter cold air began to lift back to the north and the kids were sent back to school. Proceeding this Arctic air event, much of the Midwest and Northeast experienced a wet mid-January thaw as a parade of lows swept across the country. But by the third week of January, meteorologists were confident that yet another blast of cold Arctic air would sweep through the Southeast within the week. And this time, conditions look favorable for snow. On January 26, temperatures in the southeast rose well into the 60s as warm air from the Gulf streamed into the region. But a thousand miles to the north, an Arctic cold front was quickly digging southward into the upper Midwest. Aloft, the jet stream was pushing down into the mid-Atlantic, containing fierce winds moving at over 150 knots. The thought process was that if this Arctic front would continue to push down into the Gulf of Mexico, widespread rain, snow, and freezing rain may occur along that temperature boundary. With these concerns in mind, the National Weather Service issued a winter storm watch for the 28th and 29th, citing expected snow accumulations of two or more inches and sleet accumulations of half an inch or more. Now, it's important to mention that predicting the rain-snow line in these winter storms, especially in the ones occurring in the southern United States, is a critical and difficult process. When precipitation falls as more sleet than snow, the accumulation of that precipitation will be much less. If you want to know more about the rain-snow line, be sure to see my last video on the Montreal ice storm of 1998. As the evening fell on the 26th, confidence grew in a widespread winter event across Alabama and Georgia, and at 4.53 a.m. on the 27th, the winter storm watch was expanded 30 miles north to include all of Atlanta. By the next morning, the cold front was punching through the I-20 corridor. As temperatures were falling into the 40s, the National Weather Service in Peachtree gave a weather briefing on the upcoming winter storm to state officials and media partners, which may be the most 2014 PowerPoint I've ever seen in my life. The setup for the event was clear. A weak low was forming in the Gulf of Mexico along the cold front, injecting moisture northward into central Alabama and Georgia, where it would fall in a swath of snow and rain. But there was significant uncertainty on exactly where the heaviest snow slash freezing rain would occur. The locally higher elevations of the Piedmont region from Macon to Atlanta would likely see more snow than sleet, and the coastal plain to the south would likely see more sleet and freezing rain. But I'd like to make the case that these two maps are kind of confusing to the public. It's clear looking at the forecast radar imagery that Atlanta is on the far northern fringe of the expected deformation zone where the snow was to occur. But if you look at the expected snowfall accumulation map, it clearly shows 2.1 inches in the Atlanta metro, and you'll soon see why this was important. The precipitation was expected to pick up around noon on the 28th and continue for about 24 hours, followed by a hard freeze statewide. Because of this, messages were sent out on social media and to the local news to expect a risky commute home from work due to the snow and sleet. All right, the elephant in the room. 
People love to make fun of the South when they receive an accumulation of winter precipitation that wouldn't even be considered a minor inconvenience up north. And yeah, it's ironic that two inches of snow can shut down Houston or Dallas or Atlanta, but it's actually quite scary, and I don't think making fun of it is that productive. Hear me out. Atlanta is a huge city built on car dependency. And while in recent years it seems to be moving in the right direction, the urban sprawl is expansive and complex, and traffic is a nightmare. Ranked as the 10th worst city in the US for traffic, it has some of the most head scratching traffic bottlenecks in the country. The majority of these bottlenecks are located along I-285, which runs along an eight mile radius from downtown, but the massive 12 lane interchange between I-85 and I-20 is also a daily headache for commuters. The majority of these people who commute on these highways every day don't have adequate experience driving in snow and ice, and frankly, that's not their fault. It's not something you can practice and retain when it snows once or twice a year. But by far, I think the biggest factor in all of this is the general lack of snow and ice removal equipment in the Sun Belt. It's reported that Atlanta had about 70 snow plows and salt trucks on hand ready to clear and salt the roads as precipitation picked up on Tuesday afternoon. As you can infer, this is not a lot. Boston, for example, had 170 city-owned plows in 2022, but also had a list of over 800 privately owned snow plows they could call upon for big winter snowstorms. By the afternoon and evening of the 27th, a winter storm warning was issued for central Georgia, and a winter weather advisory that was issued for Atlanta proper was also upgraded to a winter storm warning. The weather office also prepared an updated briefing for 9 a.m. on the 28th with a couple significant changes to the forecast. One, the greatest precipitation was going to fall between three and seven instead of seven and midnight. And two, the start of the precipitation would likely be closer to 10 a.m. than noon. Now, a winter storm warning by definition is issued for an area where there is an 80% or greater chance of a winter weather event having at least one predominant hazard, snow, sleet, or freezing rain, and is expected to cause a significant impact. The storm must meet at least one of these criteria, two or more inches of snow in 12 hours, or four inches or more in 24 hours in the lower elevations, half an inch or more of sleet, or a quarter inch or more of freezing rain. And while the morning commute on the 28th was indeed dry, a swath of freezing rain, sleet, and snow quickly moved into central Georgia at around 10.30 a.m. The good thing is some of the major roads along hospital routes were treated with salt prior to the snow starting. But with temperatures at the surface in the mid and upper 20s, the rain and sleet was still able to freeze rapidly upon contact with the ground. Local businesses and schools and state officials realized that this would be a major issue for the commute home, so around 1.30 p.m., they all decided to close. This, of course, meant that parents who were now at work could drive to their child's school and pick them up and then drive home. But remember how traffic is like really bad in Atlanta and most of the drivers aren't experienced with driving in snow let alone black ice, not to mention that with everybody on the interstate at the exact same time, the snow and salt trucks couldn't get on the roads to help clear them. Yeah, this was a recipe for a disaster. By 3 p.m., every major interstate and state route within the Atlanta metro area was at a complete standstill. Up to half an inch of ice and over an inch of snow now coated the roadways, and nobody was able to get traction. As cars and trucks try to inch their way forward, they would just slide laterally into neighboring lanes, causing an unfathomable 1,200 traffic accidents. The worrisome part was that many of these people on the roads were parents who were heading towards their child's school to pick them up. So now you had all these children still at school that would likely be stuck there overnight. Thankfully, the school staff members were also stuck there and they did everything they could to help the students relax, like give everyone gym mats to rest on, showing different movies, and made hot meals in the cafeteria. The children who had it the worst were likely one of the 99 stranded school buses in Fulton County. 8,000 total students were stuck on the road. And as the evening grew dark, patience wore thin. 
Truck drivers transporting goods across the country who were stuck on the roads likely had it the best. They were used to a lifestyle of travel and potential delays and had water and snacks in their cabs. Atlanta locals who were within a couple miles of their destination full on abandoned their vehicles on the highway and attempted to walk home in the frigid air. One parent, Mark Nilsson, walked six miles on the ice to get his daughter who was stuck at school. Amidst the chaos and with most people stuck sitting in their cars with their iPhone 5Ss, social media was a great place to vent frustrations and possibly help victims. One of these spaces was a Facebook page called Snowed Out Atlanta, where 25,000 members joined within a few hours to help connect those who were stranded to areas of shelter, whether that be a Good Samaritan's home or a public store like a CVS or a Taco Bell, which yeah, people did spend the night inside. This page became crucial as the night wore on because the priority shifted from getting people home to just getting them food, water, and heat. Gas was a finite resource, and even if you wanted to sleep in your car, temperatures were in the low 20s, and it was hard to stay warm. There were hundreds of incredible stories from this event. A baby named Grace was delivered in one of the stranded vehicles, which I can't even imagine how stressful that would be. The ultimate savior in this event was actually the sun. About 18 hours later, the temperature warmed to above freezing, and the sun melted a significant portion of the ice, so drivers carefully made their way back to their cars, and traffic slowly trickled down the road once again. When asked about the disastrous result, Georgia Governor Nathan Deal emphasized that the storm was much worse than anyone anticipated. Was it though? I mean, look at the briefing sent out by the National Weather Service and the definition of a winter storm warning. Two inches of snow and less than half an inch of ice was pretty much spot on. I mean. Atlanta got closer to two and a half, but still. It sounds like the city of Atlanta failed to recognize the impact that those specific weather conditions could have on daily life. Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed had this to add. We made a mistake by not staggering when people should leave. If we had it to do again, we would have said schools, you go out, you go first. Private sector businesses, you go second. And government goes last. You know, as much as this sounds like a better idea, I personally don't think this would have made a huge difference. The only way this would have worked is if salt trucks were continuously able to treat the roads and any amount of traffic accidents or closures or blockages would have prevented that. I've also seen reports that despite city officials talking about a lot of these salt trucks, Atlanta is known to spread sand on the roads to increase traction and not salt. Salt is expensive to properly store because it must remain in a completely dry environment. Otherwise, it turns into a giant salt brick. Sand in this specific situation would not have helped at all because there was so much ice on the road. The ironic ending to this story happened not two weeks later when Atlanta was given an opportunity to redeem itself. On February 12th, a historic ice storm trucked across the Southeast covering Atlanta in over half an inch of ice. But this time, people stayed home and off the highways. The streets were deserted. Southern states do get pretty severe ice storms and they take them very seriously. I think in part why Snowmageddon was such a disaster was because it was forecasted and depicted as this odd hybrid winter weather event with some sleet and snow. Nobody really knew what the appropriate reaction was. I think if they heard it was gonna be an ice storm, they would have probably taken greater action, but that's not really the meteorologist's fault because it was a true combination of snow and ice. People are interesting creatures. I hope you guys enjoyed learning about this odd winter weather event in the South. It's one that I often forget about. I think it gets overshadowed by the February 12th ice storm, but this was just a complete disaster and uh, I'm glad that everybody made it out okay. If you're watching this video the day it gets uploaded, I'm probably already down south on a trip filming for next month's video, which I'm very excited about. Hope you guys have a warmer rest of the winter, and I will see you soon.